was, I asked for a quick show of hands earlier as to who has been here before, and uh, I think about maybe 50% were first timers here, so uh, what I'm about to say means absolutely nothing to you initially. Uh, for those who have been here before, it depends when you were here before. Um, I've been here for all 14 presentations, four, 14 meetups, sorry, uh, and I have spoken at 12 of them so far. Um, so if you happen to have been at one of those 12, you'll have seen me before, you'll know a little bit about me, and you'll know that. Uh, I've been very passionate about following a, a flight tracking project, which is tracking commercial aircraft in near real time using a Raspberry Pi, Kafka, and Vertigo. And uh, again, apologies to those who haven't been here before, because I say that will mean absolutely nothing to you. Um, you missed a great 12 sessions. <laughs> well, I say so, uh, but that's just me. Um, but for those who know me very, very well, <coughs> um, they'll know that I'm not renowned for my sense of fashion. Well, that's what my wife tells me anyway. And uh, so having been asked to arrange for this uh, uh, Big Data Machine Learning Meetup where we're going to talk about fashion and retail, as you can probably imagine, for me to do a presentation, that was going to be quite a challenge because I'm not in that industry, I don't know a huge amount about it. So in this talk, what I'm hoping to be able to demonstrate is how history has played uh, a vital role in shaping where we are today. And to provide some, uh, a series of use cases uh, from both the fashion and the retail industry that have been directly impacted by the innovations in information technology over the, over the years. Um, finally, sort of debating whether I should make a fashion statement, well clearly I haven't, but should I make a fashion statement at this event? Um, I, I was tempted to wear my 1980s tank top and my corduroy trousers, and yes, I did have a quick look around to make sure I wasn't going to insult anybody before I did so. Um, so if somebody is hiding something, I, I, I apologise for that, yes. Um, but I decided in the end that I wasn't going to do anything along those lines, that I would uh, do tie my hand at some graphic design. Not that I'm an expert at that anyway. Uh, anybody like my design? One show of hands. Perfect. That's what I wanted. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> it works. It works. One. <laughs> Sorry? Is it that he said like that one? He likes that. One person liked it. That's one out of, I think I counted on eight to five of you in the room. So, I, okay. I've got a lot of work to do on my graphic design work. Oops, sorry. That's it. So, um, a little about me. Uh, for those who don't know me at all, um, I started in the early 1980s as a mainframe COBOL programmer. And of course, half the audience here will say, what's a mainframe and what's COBOL? And I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is very much true. Um, the other half of the audience might say I recognise one or the other. But from the mid-1980s, I followed Michael Stonebreaker's legacy. Now, Michael Stonebreaker might mean absolutely nothing to you at all at the moment. Hopefully, in a few moments of time, it will. I started out as an ingress developer, database administrator, back in the University of Wales for about 10 years. Then became an ingress consultant, working in the utilities industry, so gas and electricity. Worked for Rolls Royce for a short period of time. No, they don't make motor cars anymore, in case anybody asks me for that. Um, I then became a principal consultant at Ingress Corporation, Stroke Action Corporation, the game under two names. I sat there for 10 years. And it was whilst there that I sort of honed my skills into not just ordinary relational database management systems, but got more involved in the high performance analytic databases and column store databases, some of which I'm going to touch on in just a few moments' time. In 2016, I moved over to uh, what was then Hewlett Packard Enterprise, now part of the Microfocus organization, but that's just a name. For me, it's Vertica. So everything that I talk about in, in my life today is, is Vertica related. Um, as you probably gathered already, I'm one of the founders of the London uh, Big Data Machine Learning Meetup group. We have another group in Cambridge, the UK, Cambridge that is. And I'm a co-founder of one in Munich as well, although we only meet very infrequently in, in, um, in, uh, in, in Munich. But I'm also a geek. So for those who know me, they'll talk about Raspberry Pis and Raspberry Pi stacks and narrow boats and sailing down the River Thames on a narrow boat and all the silly things that, geek, that geeks generally do. <laughs> However, all good, uh, like any good story, um, we have to start a long, long time ago. Though this is no fairy tale, hopefully some of this that I'm going to talk about is going to be true. Anybody recognize this? Space. I need a bit more. 
Oh, excellent. I haven't got that many t-shirts to give out, but you're getting get the trend. <laughs> um, I have got some other sizes if these don't fit, by the way. Yes, I'm just randomly throwing some t-shirts out at the moment. But yes, this is, as quite correctly, quite correctly identified, the Hubble Space Telescope launched in 1990, named after Edwin Hubble. You're thinking, what's this got to do with where we're going? Hopefully it will all make sense very, very shortly. <clears throat> but let's go back a little bit further. As you can probably tell by the fact that I started uh, 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 as a cobalt mainframe, sorry, mainframe cobalt developer in the 1980s, I thought, oh, that didn't work. I thought I'd bring out some family photographs. <laughs> okay, maybe not quite that old. A beautiful group of young ladies. Uh, I don't know how that gentleman got stuck in the middle of there. Uh, on the top top side of the, of the picture there, and then clearly they're working, doing something down the bottom here. But more importantly, I'm going to zoom into this one lady here. Does anybody recognise that one lady? No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> good guess, though. An absolutely good guess. Say it. No, say same answer we had over here. No, this happens to be a young lady. So nobody's going to get the free T-shirt. I'm going to have a spare one in a minute, so I'm going to have to start giving them away. Yes. Um, I'm afraid it is. Yes. Okay. This is something called Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She was an American astronomer back in 1893. She worked as, at Harvard College as an Harvard College Observatory as what was called then, at that time, a computer. So she was then known as one of the Harvard computers. So we're sort of tying into some of the names of uh, the, the, that came into the title of this presentation. And one of her tasks, along with her colleagues, was to uh, uh, examine photographic plates. Now again, coming back to history, most people say, well, I take photographs using my mobile camera, my camera at the moment. I don't What's a photographic plate? Well, irrelevant. It's a photograph. And what she was doing was examining photographic plates using, in this case, a magnifying glass to, in minute detail, in order to determine and catalogue the, so measure and catalogue the luminosity of stars in the sky. Her discovery was the first that allowed astronomers to measure the distance between the Earth and faraway galaxies. She did, however, receive very, very little recognition. However, it was a discovery that she made that enabled Edwin Hubble to make his discovery that the Milky Way wasn't the only galaxy out there. Of course, Hubble became an instant celebrity, winning medals and prizes, and having that giant orbiting telescope named after him. And by the way, the 1800s, so it was all in black and white, just in case anybody was wondering. Let's go further back. Right, who recognises this gentleman? I'm going to keep on with t-shirts, this is great news. Yes, yes! <laughs> well done that gentleman. So, coming over. Hopefully. <laughs> now, brilliant if you could actually recognise him because I actually doubt whether that facsimile of him is actually a picture of him. Because this gentleman <laughs> as you quite rightly identified, Thomas Bayes. He was an English statistician, philosopher, and Presbyterian minister. Wow, what a combination <laughs> that you could possibly have, yes. And there's even question marks over the date of his death. It was believed to be 1761, but that's not even 100% sure. But what he did, he studied how to compute the distribution of the probability parameter of the binomial distribution, as we now know. Um, uh, eventually was published by a gentleman called Richard Price after a significant number of edits in 1763 and is now known as the Bayes' Theorem, something that we now use very heavily in advanced analytics machine learning. More of that in a few moments' time. No t-shirts for this one, or maybe I will because I've got a spare one now. <laughs> Anybody recognise that submarine? I can't vouch for whether it's the first nuclear one, <laughs> but it was certainly a nuclear submarine. And you give me its name. No, it wasn't Russian. So no, that's a negative. Sorry, no, no, it was definitely not Russian. 
Any advances on? No? Okay, no t-shirts, okay. So this was the USS Scorpion, so it certainly wasn't Russian. <laughs> yes, it might have been taken out by the Russians, but that's another story altogether. I can't vouch for that. It was what's known as a Skipjack class high-speed attack submarine. Yes, it was a nuclear submarine. It was lost in May 1968, somewhere between the Azores and the eastern seaboard, a very small area to try and find it, about 2,600 miles. Now, the, uh, for about eight days, the US forces used 37 ships and six long-range patrol aircraft to scour that 2,600-mile corridor try of ocean between the Azores and uh, the eastern seaboard to try and find or try to locate that submarine. Unfortunately, they were unsuccessful. And eventually announced that 99 crewmen had lost their lives at sea. Shortly afterwards, it's now become a recovery mission. So they employed the services of uh, Dr. John Craven, part of the uh, US Navy Chief, he's a, sorry, he was a US Navy Chief Scientist, and he was going to use this Bay Theorem, which had been thought of uh, hundreds of years previously, and what he did, he gathered thousands of hours of interviews with expert submariners and came up with nine scenarios for the possible sinking or the disappearance, sorry, of the, of the submarine. It might have been a fire on board, it might have been a torpedo exploding in the bay, it might have been a Russian takeout, we don't, we don't know, and we still don't know today. He then used Bayes' theorem and weighed the prior probability of each of the scenarios and came up with running a, so a series of uh, computer simulations to define a search effectiveness probability for each of the cells on the grid. They located the scorpion in its final resting place. Bearing in mind this was an area of 2,600 miles, they located it 260 yards from the first point that they actually thought it was going to be. And the reason why they didn't find it in the first place that they thought it was going to be because apparently the sonar on the ship that was searching had a fault on the day that it was passing over and they went back to it. So, for those of us who are now familiar with current technologies and what seems to be the tremendous rate of growth, it pays to remember that an awful, of lot, awful lot of what we're using today was envisaged quite some time ago. Appreciating that I've only just picked a couple of examples in here, there are many others, of course, such as Florence Nightingale, who developed various uh, 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 statistical models as well from that point of view. But one thing that these all have in common, there wasn't a digital computer in sight. Fast forward a few decades. Now, after this long evening, uh, and bearing in mind I've been up since about 4am this morning, I've travelled from South Wales, I'm going to be rather tired, I need to find my way back to my hotel, so I'm going to use the London Underground. Hopefully I won't use this map here because I'll never get there. Now, for those who haven't seen this map before, this, this diagram before, it's a very useful diagram which <coughs> gives a, a chronology of the, uh, of the relational database management systems back from the 1970s through to the present day. It also serves a few other purposes it highlights just how many relational database management systems there are out there. Okay? T-shirt time coming up. Who is this gentleman? Stonebreaker. I didn't see who, so you just asked. Good man. Oh. I should say there's a one T-shirt rule, but I don't think we're going to get to that, are we? <laughs> Absolutely right. This is Michael Stonebreaker. And I did mention in my introduction that uh, I followed Stonebreaker's legacy for for many, many years. Now, Stonebreaker is the only person who's won the Turing Award, he won it in 2014, for fundamental contributions to the concepts and practices underlying modern database systems. <laughs> wow. Now, for those who don't know what the Turing Award is, and most people with respect do not know what it is, consider it to be the Oscars of the database world. That's how I like to think of it. Okay? So he's an important gentleman, as far as I'm concerned. One of the reasons why I follow him. Now, Back in the 1970s, he designed with his colleagues and built one of the first relational database management systems called Ingress. Show of hands, who's heard of Ingress? A small number, that's about 10. Ingress source code, sorry, Ingress as a product is still there today. You can still go and buy Ingress. Not from Ingress Corporation, you can buy it from another company, but that's irrelevant. Ingress source code deviated into another relational database management system called Postgres. Show of hands for Postgres. 
and we got at least three times. <laughs> yes. So you might have heard. <laughs> You've heard the postcard, but you haven't actually heard where it came from, which you always always find quite interesting. Um, I always like to, to, to equate it to a story of, of the Betamax and VHS story. And of course, for the majority of the people in the room, they'll go, what's VHS and Betamax? But for those of my age, you'll know what I mean, hopefully. <laughs> yes. So, um, Michael Stonebreaker built and designed the first relational database management system that's called Ingress, from which many others have spawned. <clears throat> now, one of the things he did, and before I continue, what's going to do, I'm going to add a couple of words to relational database management system, which at the time in the 1970s and 1980s actually meant nothing because they didn't use this term. What they had designed was what we're now going to call a row orientated or row store, depending on how you want to call it, relational database management system. These were designed at that time for online transaction processing workloads. They are the bedrock of database warehouses. Or well, they were the bedrock of database warehouses. And I put a couple of examples on the right hand side, obviously with Ingress, Postgres. Show of hands for Oracle. Yes, the world knows Oracle. DB2, Sybase, MySQL, SQL Server, yes. <laughs> I can see hands going up and down. So somewhere, I think, in the audience, most of you have heard of at least one, possibly more than one, of these relational database management systems because they are almost family names. What's that? Oh, here's a test. Here's a test for those, 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 those who are as old as me. <laughs> Very close. No. Yes. <laughs> Who said Austin Maxi? <laughs> okay. All right. Last T-shirt. <laughs> Thank you. Ooh. Okay. So the Austin Maxi. It was designed for a particular purpose. Yes. It was designed to carry four or five passengers with some luggage. And yes, it had an engine in the bonnet, and you could put the luggage in the boot. Any Americans amongst us tonight? Oh, disappointing. Uh, very disappointing. So the next picture, of course, is of an American vehicle of about the same sort of thing. Same design, same sort of principle designed for driving on tarmac Adam roads to take your family to the zoo or whatever you're going to do. Of course, the biggest difference, of course, it's a much bigger car. I don't know why we always think of American cars being much bigger than the British cars. But uh, the other difference is, of course, it doesn't have a bonnet. It has a hood and it doesn't have a boot. It has a... <laughs> okay, yeah, we have to be different, of course. There's no reason why we shouldn't be. So, in moving forwards, what's happened more recently, of course, and I'd say recently depends who you talk to, whether it's in the last couple of years or maybe the last five or ten years, we start to talk about big data, and I appreciate somebody before I uh, was asking Jay about small data, yes, which is very interesting. I'm going to talk about big data for the moment, but I quite appreciate what you're saying there. We talk about big data, machine learning, predictive analytics, artificial intelligence, all these new buzzwords that are coming out, or have been out there now for quite a few years. But let's think where all this started, back in the 1980s again. So if you were using those uh, row-orientated relational database management systems, the ingresses, the oracles of this world in the 1980s, you've got to store your data somewhere. So why not you buy one of these nice little beasties from IBM, a 33380. Uh, um, each of those cabinets, by the way, is about two meters tall. There are eight of those cabinets. Each of those cabinets has two disk drives. Each of those disk drives has 2.5 gigabytes of storage. And each drive weighs 32 kilograms. And will set you back a pricey set of about $150,000. So big data in the 1980s was never going to happen. Not in the way that we see big data today. The closest I could find today, and yes, I could have picked a micro SD card, but you probably wouldn't have seen it. Uh, yes, a micro, so an SD card, the closest I could find today, what's that? Uh, an SD card of 32 gigabytes will cost you about $10, just a couple of pounds in reality today. So the world has changed from the storage perspective for what we can do with how much data we can store uh, and, and do so at a, at a hugely reduced cost. But it's not just storage. Computing is a lot more than just storage. We also talk about processing power. So let's talk at 1951. No, I wasn't around in 1951. 1951, the UNIVAC 1 computer could perform approximately 2,000 calculations per second. 
And in 1951, I was trying to get an Aston Martin out of the British plate, but unfortunately the closest I could find was the French plate. So in 1951, the Aston Martin DB2 could reach a speed of 116 miles per hour. Fast forward to 2018. In fact, this is very hot off the press. This is June 2018. IBM released their Summit computer with 200 teteflops. I think I've got the right number of zeros on the end, and please correct me if I got it wrong. I have asked a colleague to check over some of my later calculations, and he says they look okay to him. But that's an awful lot of calculations per second compared to that Univac one of 2,000 instructions per second. Now, if the car industry had managed to keep up with the process or the rate of change that the computer industry has done, we would now have an Aston Martin DB something that could travel 16 million times the speed of light. So that puts it into some perspective, I hope, yes, as to how processing power, how disk storage has improved. And I'm not going to go on to everything else, so we'll be here all night. But there's everything else. There's computer memory, there's networking, there's solid-state devices, and everything else that forms the form of computing power that we have today. And what we're leading towards is a scenario where things that were not possible, or impossible, uh, 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 prior to computing came out, even when computers were first invented, it didn't solve all of the problems, and only now are we starting to be able to do things that we couldn't do previously. So, we talk about the hardware. We talk about the physical capabilities of computing power, so the physical uh, storage, the, the, the processing power, the memory, the networking, and all the infrastructure that forms a computer system. But what happened to those role-orientated relational database management systems? Is Oracle still around? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> still go out there. Yes, yeah. one, one of the biggest software companies in the world, so I'm presuming they're still around doing something. Um, so these uh, relational database, say these row store relational database management systems, yeah, uh, what they're still doing, they're designed for LTP work. Well, that hasn't changed. Um, they're still the bedrock of traditional data warehouses. There's no question about that. We're not taking that away from them. Yes, they may have a new look and feel. Yes, they may have some new gadgets and some safety features built into them. And yes, they may be a little bit faster, just like the cars have done. So the cars from the 1980s, yes, they've slightly improved. I quite like this photo, because I found this. The UK cars on the left and the, the, the American cars on the right. I think the American car actually looks a bit smaller, but uh, that's just me. The question is, coming back to the big data, machine learning, advanced analytics, predictive analytics, and things that people are now trying to do with their databases, can we do that still? Can we do that? Well, yes, of course we can. We can use our row orientated relational database management systems. There's nothing stopping us using them. Um, the problem is you might have to wait for the results to come through. You also might have to downsample your data. Rather than using the full data set to do your machine learning algorithms, you might have to downsample it and do a subset of data. You might have to have data summarized and aggregated because you can't <coughs> store the data as, as, as adequately as you might want to and uh, achieve the same sort of performance. You might not be able to restore, retain historic data. You might only be able to work on current data or the last few months worth of data because you can't process, you can't store the larger volumes of historic data. Some of the possible solutions, yeah, throw lots more hardware and lots more money at the problem. Buy faster computers, buy more of them. <laughs> Doesn't address the underlying problem that the database management system is trying to, you're trying to use a database management system for something that you weren't, it wasn't designed for. You can implement many and maintain many complex structures. So you can do something with the database management system to try and make it run faster. And yes, there are certain ways of doing that. You can throw everything into the data lake. Apparently, that's going to solve all of your problems. Not. You could put some go faster stripes on it. That will make it go faster. That doesn't work either, by the way. So. I mentioned Stonebreaker at the outset. Stonebreaker uh, is an academic, always has been, always will be. As I say, he built the first relational database management system back in the 1970s, late 1970s. And in the 2003, I think it was, 2003, 2004, he looked back at what he'd produced 
um, uh, uh, those, those, those decades before, and said, what I built, or what I designed, is absolutely fit for purpose. The problem is, the world has moved on, and people are now trying to use the databases to do things that they weren't designed for. Fine, what they're doing is absolutely perfect, but I need to rethink what we need to do to database, relational database management systems to enable them to be able to perform those high performance analytic machine learning type capabilities that we were, we were shouting out for. So in 2003, Stonebreaker um, wrote a, a paper called the C-Store column orientated database. Now I mentioned earlier about the row orientated database, yes, which was the de facto standard of when the first build databases. He's come up with something else called a column store database. More that in just a moment. He then went on to build something called the C store database and in turn went on to build Vertica. Now, this is one slide that I've just taken out of one of our sales decks. I'm not using it as a sales piece, but I just want to pull three components out here. Why a columnar, a column store database is so important. And the ones I'm going to pick out are the three called column orientation where we reduce the bottleneck. One of the biggest bottlenecks in any computer system is disk input and output. That's what takes the time in running queries against large volumes of data. The second one to look at is advanced compression. When you start to talk about big data, one of the things people often forget is that the more data you store, the more hardware you've got to buy to store it and maintain it and back up, and move around, and update, and so on and so forth. So anything we can do to reduce the footprint on disk of your big data, then surely that's a good way forward. And the final one to just briefly touch on is massively parallel processing. The moment you start to talk about big data, it is no longer convenient to run your database on a laptop. Yeah, you can if you want to take your time. So you go and buy yourself a... Uh, uh, a HP DL380 with uh, 32 cores of, of, of processing power with uh, 256 gigabytes of memory and some solid state disks. So yes, it's brilliant at doing what you want to do, but then you suddenly realize, actually, I want to do 10 times that. So then you have to scale out. That's one number three. Um, so common orientation. So what Vertica is doing now, who's familiar with SQL here? Now, I appreciate this is... Okay, the vast majority, that's good. Okay, apologies to those who are not familiar with SQL. On the left-hand side, I've got the simplest piece of SQL you could possibly imagine. Yes, just to make this, this as simple as possible. Select the average price from a table called tick store with a where condition where the symbol is AAPL and the date is a particular date. Nothing complex about that SQL, I trust. Yes, but just to prove the point. Now, when you think, when you consider what any database technology needs to satisfy that query, how many columns in the tick store table <coughs> does that query need to be satisfied? Yes, indeed. Because we're only looking for three columns, in this case, we want the average price, the tick, sorry, sorry, the average price, the symbol, and the date. So we only need three columns from the table. How many columns might that table have? It could have hundreds. It could have thousands, potentially. It might just have three. But it could have lots more. Now, traditional row store databases, the Oracles, the Ingresses, the SQL servers of this world, are row orientated databases. I know you can tweak them by creating secondary indexes and all that cubes and all the other bits and pieces, but out of the box, if you want to run a query like that against a row store database, you are going to read every row, every column from that table, regardless of whether you need every row and every column. When you look at column store database, and all column stores are identical in this perspective, is that they store the data, surprisingly, in columns. So, in this case, the only disk I.O. that this database needs to do is read that column, that column, and that column, ignoring all the others. So if you had a hundred rows, so probably a hundred columns in your table, you only wanted three, you only read three. Hugely reducing the disk I.O., hugely improving performance. Now, these sorts of technologies, column store database technologies, are brilliant at load and read intensive workloads. They are not designed for 
transact OLTP, online transaction processing workloads. They weren't designed for that. They were designed for analytical queries and loading huge volumes of data. Analytical queries are those sorts of queries. Compression. Who's heard of GZIP? I thought there was an awful lot more hands to go up for that. Okay. Compression. Um, you may have received a, a zipped file, a compressed <coughs> file, as an attachment to an email. And in its compressed format, as its name implies, that the original file has been squashed into a smaller footprint so that it is quicker and cheaper to transport via email or via other means. However, before you can actually use that file, you'd have to uncompress it. <coughs> okay? Now, what Vertica does is because we are storing the data in columns, we can uh, pick and choose from one of 14 uh, decode algorithms that we can use to compress the data. I'll only go to one example here, the transaction date. So think about a transaction date in a store, yes, where you're, you're recording the, at the point of sale, somebody's bought something on this particular date. And you might have thousands, you might have millions of those transactions on a single date. And if you store it inside your Oracle database, your SQL Server database, whatever, you're typically going to store it as a fixed length date format. Let's just say it's 10 characters. So you may be storing megabytes per day just to store all of the transaction dates for a single date. What a column store database does is it compresses that data by using one of, say, 14 compression algorithms, run length encoding being one such example. If it realizes that all the dates are the same for this date, which they would be because it's the same date, why does it store it a million times? Why not store it once? And then have an integer which says, I've got a million of those. So again, reducing disk I.O., which is again the slowest part of, of any computing system. And then finally on this one, massively parallel processing. Being able to distribute the workload of your queries as your data gets larger over many, many nodes in a computing uh, cluster, such that each one can contribute to the execution of the query. So if you have one node compared to three nodes, theoretically the three node cluster will run three times faster than a single node. Talking about machine learning. So one thing that we're starting to talk about a lot more now is doing machine learning. Any data scientists amongst us? Just, yes, yeah, small number. May I ask what tools you use today? R, yeah, Python. Python. Uh, what databases do you connect to? If you do, MongoDB. Now, at the moment, do you extract the data from the database to do the processing in R Studio or wherever, and then push the results out? Is that the way you do it? Which is valid. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just, I'm just asking if that's the way you do it. Now, what a lot of people are finding is that they want to be able to do the processing, the, SD, the data preparation, data exploration, um, uh, the, data, uh, the data understanding in database. Why move the data when the data is already there in the database? Why not put the processing into the database? It will enable you to run your Python or your R code directly in the database without pulling the data out of the database to do the processing. Who writes Spark uh, Scala code? Wouldn't it be nice if you could reduce the amount of work you have to do by a quarter? You could spend more time watching the football or whatever your favorite pastime is. So an example here, um, by doing the data, data analytics inside the database, you can use standard SQL function calls to do various things. And that's an exact, a, de a, a, a identical replica of what you would do in Scala to achieve this, as opposed to doing it in SQL. So, That was a quick introduction to column store databases, history to how we got to where we are today. Yes, we can continue to do uh, uh, our analytic processing using row store databases, and it will work perfectly well. But the world has changed. So I think well, hopefully we can all agree that we're in an, area, in, in, a, in an era now where we can, if we want to, to do complex things, complex analytics, machine learning, predictive analytics, artificial intelligence type applications, but do them really quickly. And do so on huge quantities of data. So the next challenge is, well, what are people doing with this? Now I've been in, as you probably gathered, I've been in this industry now for 
<laughs> you got your mates? <laughs> so, I've seen a lot of use cases come and go over the time. I think what I've just done here, and this is really related to what we're talking about on, on, on tonight. So, I want to give you a sort of feel as to how we got to where we are today. But what our customers are using Vertica as a column store analytics database for. A uh, random sample of some of the companies that are... Uh, uh, some of whom I have worked with directly myself, but not all of them, I hasten to say. So I picked a, I picked a small uh, handful of retail and fashion companies. Um, I suppose you can argue the only one that isn't a retail and fashion company is this one at the top right-hand corner. Hopefully that will make sense in just a few moments' time. Um, so what I want to hope to cover in the next couple of minutes is just how some of these have used uh, uh, analytics in their, in their particular use cases. Now, what I should say is that the majority of what I'm about to present hasn't come from me. This has come from our customers, so it's their presentations when they're boasting about how brilliant they are and what they do, as opposed to how brilliant we are. So I'm speaking on behalf of the customers in this particular case. So if you have a lot of technical questions, I might not be able to answer them. I might have you to deviate into the, uh, the customers themselves. So let's just pick one, lab for motion. I'd never heard of them. Has anybody else? <laughs> I rest my case. <laughs> yes. Let's just go back on slide. Uh, any other names you recognise on there? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> so I'm not just making up names then. That's a good one. <laughs> okay, I'm going to start with Lab for Motion. Who are Lab for Motion? Oops, sorry, Polish. I'm sorry, sorry. They're a Polish company, founded in 2011. So a wonderful, uh, in their one sentence, gosh, what a long sentence it is, but I'm going to read to it. We are the Google <laughs> Analytics of the offline world, providing a solution which performs real-time, automatic interpretation of all our customers' interactions in all customer touch points concurrently, standardizing and streamlining the customer service and sales process by providing automatic responses, alerts, and initiating workflows supported by real-time analytics. Gosh, can we make a sentence any longer, please? <laughs> But uh, one sentence, that's what they want to do. And they do so, uh, we make this possible by utilising a combination of neural networks, artificial intelligence. It's all, it's all sales patter at the moment. But let's have a look at some of the way they actually do it, which is quite interesting. So today's typical customer touch points, whether it's an application, whether it's email, whether it's a web page, whether it's a, a social media, or whether it's calling a call centre. And... Many companies have taken those touch points and they have developed or they have deployed a series of multiple assistants, a systems to, to support those. However, what we do find quite common is that they're not deeply integrated with each other and they require heavy manual interaction. But more importantly, what they have missed out is the physical store. So all of those things that we saw previously were typically electronic or maybe the people that you speak to on the, on the end of the telephone. So what these guys are doing here, yes, is they're doing this uh, the Google Analytics of types of information for the offline world. So they want to be able to monitor queues, people counters, customer flow, uh, number of visits and time spent in chosen zones, <coughs> store zones, and service time, how long they're waiting at a particular service point and so forth. So how have they done it? In their particular case, they have covered the entire store or the part that they're interested in um, with 3D cameras ensuring the highest accuracy of measurement. Um, the number of cameras that they need obviously depends on the area that you're covering and such things as obstacles that might be in the way or the height of ceilings and so forth. And then finally, they calibrate their software so that they get a single view of the whole store or work area that's being, that's being monitored. Then you're able to monitor the path or follow the path of an individual from the moment they enter that zone, or wherever that might, zone might be, all the way through their path until they eventually exit. The sorts of things that they then do is capture the data from all of their stores, they push it through their application, their uh, lab promotion, feed it, in this case they feed it into virtual, and then of course they can produce various visualizations using Tableau or whatever third-party uh, integration, uh, a third-party visualization tool that you may wish to use. Some of the values that they get out of this, of course, they're monitoring things like traffic flow outside the store, inside the store, traffic flow and dwell inside the store, product offerings and optimizations come out of this and improve the customer journey and benchmarking. So a lot of use cases are coming out of this just following people walking around the store. Yes. This doesn't tell them whether they bought anything necessarily. It just means we've followed them, we've seen where they've gone. 
did they go to this one display stand and come back to this display stand? How many times have they come back to that display stand? Uh, did they go from that display stand over to the shelf that is selling that product and from there walk over to the, to the checkout and buy that? So even without having the electronic data or point of sale data or anything else, they can actually capture this sort of information directly. Um, I stole this uh, set of presentations from a gentleman who presented at one of our meetups earlier, uh, uh, earlier last year, a company called Zoind. Uh, Zoind, exactly the same. So they specialise in retail hospitality analytics. And the three main areas of focus are the supply chain, store operations and analytics and insights. And each of those covers the following sorts of topic areas. So they're looking at real-time visibility from end to end, um, rethink rethinking, rethinking uh, transport and logistics, all the different mechanisms for click and buy, click and collect, pick and pay, same day delivery, delivery within the hour, delivery route optimization. New concepts such as dark stores, uh, drones and delivery robots. So that comes under the, the, what they, they class as supply chain. Store operations. So the stores must deliver an experience to the end user, the customer. Multi-purpose devices are being heavily used within stores. And all the new technologies that are appearing within and uh, Jay mentioned the, at least a few of those, uh, the RFIDs and so forth in his presentation. So he's understanding that these are all part and play part of. So what is happening, of course, with all of these new innovations is that the technology, as I think Jay was also mentioning, was that it is driving more and more data to be generated by demographics and zoning and dwelling and queuing. And it's being able to do something with that data which becomes important to these guys. The rise of the unknown and known, quantitative as well as so qualitative as well as quantitative, and doing everything in real time. Now, if you go back to the 1980s, it wasn't possible to do things in real time. Everything was batch related. Yes, you load your data tonight and you have your report tomorrow. That doesn't happen in the real world now. You pick up your application, you go predictive analytics, you want to be able to point at um, um, uh, 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 what we're looking at before, black, black jackets, <laughs> yes, I've chosen the black jacket, now do I want a pair of black shoes to go with it, yes? You can't do that if you're not doing things in real time, and that's how things have been progressing with the power of computing and, and, and technology. Um, I then got about three or four slides here, which are just one-off slides from each individual customer, which I tried to pick out where it is that they have seen benefit from modern technologies, yes? Who's heard of Gets? Oh, a handful, that's good. Yes, the, the waving hand, good, I feel happy. <laughs> in fact, in fact, for a t-shirt for the waving hand. <laughs> so, <laughs> safety have to carry them home, we've got them here. Okay. Um, so yes, yes, in the fashion retail. And what, what their challenge was to improve IT and business performance and empower everyone, designers, buyers, planners, and retail store managers to serve customers. And these are some of the results that they saw out of moving from a traditional uh, row store orientated database. Yes, they moved to vertical. So they reduced the workload window, load window by 50 to 62 percent. Now, some people you think, well, why does that? Why is that important? I mean, I was at a customer uh, up in Cambridge this last week, and they said, uh, we get our data from around the world, and at one o'clock in the morning we start loading the data, and it's usually ready, already loaded, ready to be queried at eight o'clock in the morning. Now they're doing this into Hortonworks, and they said, that's fine for us because we don't work overnight, so it doesn't matter that it takes all night to load the data. So there are industries today that still are happy with, let's call it, batch loading that takes forever. But many, many customers now are requiring that, re have that requirement, that uh, SLA, to be able to load data very, very quickly, but also to be able to use that data immediately. Yes? Not have to wait for it to be indexed or OLAP cubed or whatever else you might need to do to it. So importantly for these particular customers, they, they've come down from three to four hours loading to 90 minutes. Well, actually, I wasn't impressed with that. I'd like to see it even more than that. But hey, that's the idea. Um, better sales tracking due to essential daily reports generating 90 to 400 times faster. And this is from the customer. This is not, <laughs> this is not me telling you. This is from the customer. Um, I mentioned earlier on about being able to uh, use all of your data, your historic data, not having to downsample. Um, some customers want to be able to look at the, what happened over the last two years, the last ten years. 
And if you find that's prohibitive for whatever reason, whether it's licensing or storage capacity or whatever else it might be, um, you end up downsampling, downsizing the data set so that you can run your analytic queries. So these guys were working with three terabytes. They're now working with 36 terabytes of data. So they've hugely increased the volume of data that they can happily use to, 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 to satisfy their, customer, their, their business requirements. Gloria Jeans, hands up. Okay. No more t-shirts. <laughs> okay. Um, so Gloria Jeans in the fast moving fashion business, the stale information and data at rest was not an option. Again, sort of implying this, we need to have our data fresh, real time, none of this, I have to wait for data to be loaded. Yes. Um, and the largest fast fashion retailer in, in Russia and Ukraine uh, Real-time analysis on petabytes. So again, we're talking huge volumes of data, petabytes of data. There are some people actually have difficulty, including me sometimes, to try and think, what does that mean in the real world? A petabyte of data does sound a lot of data, yes? So these guys are working with huge volumes of data, and again, complex reporting frameworks used to take hours, now take seconds. And this is the sort of things that S&M Retail uh, again, they want to improve enterprise data warehousing, analytics and reporting. And again, they're coming back and saying 400 to 500% improvement in data availability. That sounds like it's a move in the right direction. Okay. Uh, the last one I want to cover is one called the Ruba, which isn't actually... Uh, sorry, anybody heard of a Ruba? As a resort, yes. And uh, it's interesting because the CEO of Ruba did a YouTube video. He said he, one of the questions he was asked was... Um, why did you call the company Aruba? I don't really know. Have you ever been there? No. <laughs> <laughs> so even the CEO. Now um, I must say, I, I was looking out there. I haven't looked in here. But if you look up in in the sky here, in the sky, in the in the in the roof space here, you might see some of their devices because it just so happens that Aruba are uh, um, uh, what they provide are. are uh, wireless access points and the most common sort of place that you find these are in places like this you don't typically find them in your house but if you go to a shopping mall or an airport or, or apparently campus london they've got a ruber wireless access points in here now one of the nice things that they're able to do yes is they want to be able to do this sort of thing similar to the one that we saw at the very beginning where they were using cameras to monitor where people were moving these are actually monitoring not the people but the phones. Now, the phone, you don't really want to follow the phone around, but typically the phone is connected to somebody because it's in their pocket or their handbag. So you are actually following somebody around. So by using a, 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 a mesh of wireless access points and capturing things like the MAC address of the device that you're carrying around with you, your longitude and your latitude, they can work out exactly where you have been, where you have walked in your store. Yes, starts to get a little frightening with personal protecting the data again, but that's another story which I'm not sure. Okay. So here again, they'll be able to, by following, by monitoring the track of your phone or your mobile device, they can follow where you have been. Again, your dwell time, your traffic flow, your zone analytics, similar to the way they were doing with the video following of people. So we can stream the data into any analytics database, hands up who's with a Kafka. And um, so we have, we have a concept of being able to stream data from wherever it's coming. Very quickly, uh, use this sort of data to plot, plot where people are. So you might want to use this data for things like maintenance, scheduling, cleaning, air uh, filter replacement, painting, based on usage of, of particular sort of locations. Uh, adjusting the air conditioning, the lighting, the thermostats, the PA systems, depending on where people are and how many people are there. Customer service, monitoring queue times, staff to associate ratios, abandonment rates and showrooming. So you can follow these people as they're standing in the queue, working their way forwards. They don't make it to the till and they disappear. You've lost a customer. Yes, or well, maybe they've jumped onto the next queue. Whichever way it goes, <laughs> you get the idea from there. Some of our use cases, marketing, public safety, rent adjustment, social, whole raft of use cases that come out of this. So... What has happened? But over the centuries, the fashion and the retail industry have undergone continuous change in how they operate. From design, manufacture, distribution, to the stores that we see today, all of which are aimed at improving customer experiences. 
enhancing profits. However, the role of IT has played in these industries also continues to involve that ever-improving enhancements to existing systems. So existing systems are improving, they are getting better, they are getting faster. But what is happening is that more and more use cases are cropping up that these role oriented database management systems cannot support. It is then that they turn to column oriented databases such as Vertica to provide the highly performant analytics on huge volumes of data to address these demands. And whilst the customers are looking to buy, the fashion and retail industry will continue to evolve. I think I have what I know. Before I take any questions, I'm sort of trying to catch the attention of my colleagues out there. To say, Can anybody smell pizzas? <laughs>